Welcome to The Definitive Rap, where we report the truth about American exceptionalism. We love our flag, we love our country, and we believe in America. The Definitive Rap, where we respect people of faith, the men and women in blue, and our support for Israel. And now your hosts, Bela Sebro. She's the nice one. And Alan Skorsky. Uh, he's not so nice. But together they are the definitive rap. I'm Alan Skorsky with my co-host Bela Seabrow, and welcome to the Definitive Rap, where we discuss the news items the mainstream media just won't touch. The Definitive Rap is proud to be the official podcast of Vinnews.com. As we just finished Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the period when our rabbis and teachers emphasize that it's time to better ourselves while asking forgiveness from those we may have harmed over the past year, the CEO of the ADL, Jonathan Greenblatt, who reportedly earns $700,000 a year to do one job, and that is expose and combat anti-Semitism, this year took it upon himself to redefine teshuva. He didn't ask his fellow Jews for forgiveness, this year, he chose to ask for forgiveness from the Muslim community because in 2010, Abe Foxman stood in opposition to building an Islamic center and mosque in the shadows of Ground Zero out of sensitivity to the families and victims of 9-11. Today's guest, whom Bela will introduce shortly, is the very distinguished professor Thane Rosenbaum, who in 2010 wrote a column titled Ground Zero Mosque and the Freedom from Pain where he stood with the ADL's Abe Foxman, who while supporting the rights of Muslims to build mosques, stood with the families of 9-11, who viewed Ground Zero as hallowed ground. Let's put aside just for the moment what motivated Greenblatt to issue an apology at this time in history, and let's put aside that one of the directors behind the mosque was an imam named Fidel Abdul Rauf Khan, who blamed U.S. policies for inspiring the radicals behind the attack. But ever since Greenblatt took over the ADL, he has moved the organization further left, often ignoring Palestinian-inspired and left-wing anti-Semitism. That one must ask, has the ADL gone from combating anti-Semitism to cautioning anti-Semitism? In today's show, we will discuss this and other glaring examples of ADL's historic left-wing bias and of Greenblatt's malpractice in combating anti-Semitism the single responsibility of his organization. Bela? Thank you, Alan. The ADL Anti-Defamation League has been known since 1913 as an organization that fights hate. In fact, their slogan is fighting hate for good. All hate of all groups. The ADL claims to fight hate in every group so that no one group or person suffers from prejudice, hate, or discrimination of any kind. And that's great. Society needs an organization committed to that cause. Humanity needs that. But for all groups to feel confident that such an organization is doing the work of its mission statement, it needs to also walk the talk, not just talk the talk. Because anybody can talk. The question is, does the ADL walk the talk? I have no problem with how much money an annual salary the CEO of the ADL earns if he's doing the job of the organization's mission. I care whether Jonathan Greenblatt is fighting hate for the Jews too. Are the Jews part of the group of society and humanity that the ADL is fighting for too? Are the Jews actually part of their mission statement for all groups to be able to participate fully in all aspects of American life, free from harassment based on anti-Semitism? We at the Definitive Rep will leave that to our audience as we hear from our prominent and illustrious guest, Thane Rosenbaum, distinguished university professor of Truro College, creative director at Forum on Life, Culture and Society, legal analyst at CBS News Radio, columnist for the Jewish Journal of Los Angeles, contributor at Newsmax, legal and Middle East analyst, and contributing writer for the White Rose Magazine. Professor Shana Tova, and welcome to the Definitive Wrap. Thank you, Bela. Thank you so much, Alan. I always enjoy always appearing on your show. Professor, 
I don't think that there are many out there who know as much about the ADL and why there is so much skepticism about the organization with regard to their allegiance or lack of lack of their in to Jews. They don't know as much as you do. So please enlighten us. We want to know if the ADL cares about the Jews and what, if anything, have they done to prove otherwise? Well, thank you. Let, let me just start with this disclaimer, which I think is important. Uh, when Abe Foxman stepped down, I was actually considered to be one of those who would replace him. I, I applied, read about that, yes. I, I applied and I was asked to apply. I applied and, and was considered, but frankly did not go very far. Um, so I wanna make that clear as a disclaimer. Secondly, I wanna say that I consider Jonathan Greenblatt a friend of mine. He and I have had lunch a few times. Uh, and I, in May, actually wrote him a, a note uh, thanking him for a position that he did take in connection with the Gaza war uh, and the unfair criticism of Israel uh, in its defense against Hamas rockets and the blame that was uh, often associated with American Jews and European Jews. As we know, Jews were attacked on the streets in the United States. And I was grateful, frankly, that Jonathan spoke out on that. So I just want to start with that disclaimer. I think it's also important to keep in mind what you said, Bela, is true, but it's, it's not just an anti-hate group. It may have become an anti-hate group. Let's remember that this organization, the Anti-Defamation League, uh, was founded on the principle of defamation against the Jewish people. That's how it started. It may have transformed itself, especially during Jonathan's era. I, I can be wrong. I, I'm often wrong. Uh, so I could be wrong. But I think that I'm right in stating that I think a few years ago, they actually officially changed the mission statement to shift officially away from purely Jewish and generalized hate to just generalized hate. Uh, I could be wrong, but I, I have a memory of that. So that's important to remember that a, a change was made and it wasn't really made by him per se, because I can tell you as someone who was considered for that position, frankly, why I, I wasn't considered very seriously is I was too Jewish for them. Yeah, they do uh, say all groups, they do say that. They do yes, say that. they say yeah. that now, right. Yes. But I'm saying that the uh, organization started as specifically defamation against the Jewish people. And just for some quick history civics lesson, it had to do with the Leo Frank uh, conviction right, right. And, and lynching in, right. in Atlanta, right? This is a story in which right. uh, a Jew from New York who had reset, settled in the South, yeah. uh, who was falsely accused of raping one mm -hmm. of his employees, when it was actually the janitor in his uh, right. employee, uh, was convicted. And then when the governor was about to commute the sentence, he was taken out of the prison and lynched. Right. And this was so shocking that a Jew would be lynched in the South that B'nai B'rith created the Anti-Defamation League. So I think it's important for your audience in the definitive rap to, to know uh, that it's at least origins was entirely about Jews mm -hmm. and about bigotry and racial and religious hatred of Jews. And yes, justice and fairness for all people. It has since, especially during this new Greenblatt era, really focused generally on what I would argue are truly progressive causes. Remember, Jonathan uh, was not a Jewish leader in any way, had not written about Jewish issues, had not spoken about Jewish issues. Uh, in fact, I would say one of the reasons no one took me seriously enough is because I wrote so much about Jewish issues and spoke so much about Jewish yeah. issues. And the board- You're The expert, as I said before. Yes. Well, but the board wasn't really yes. interested in that. They, I think, believed there was a shift. You know, this is very important to think about for Jews in the United States. You know, you can blame uh, the organization head or you could say, no, you, if you have a problem with the ADL, the problem is with the board. The board decided unilaterally with, you know, without regard to the history of the organization, that it should be a much more generalized anti-hate group. And early on, you know, their focus on transgender bathrooms, trans transgender rights. I think it was surprising to a number of Jews to go, 
why is the ADL fixated on the transgender? Why does that seem to be their fixation? Well, it had a lot to do with the board's interest in being a more progressive entity politically. Jonathan, again, did not come out of a Jewish leadership position or a Jewish academic or, or journalism, or again, that was just, he worked in the Clinton and Obama administrations. Uh, he had been a, an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. And they, I knew when I was interviewing for the job, they looked at me as, you know, sort of a, a, sec, a carbon copy of a boxman. They were looking for something else. They were looking for something that established more of the progressive gravitas of the organization. Uh, and they wanted someone who was more entrepreneurial, not a writer or a thinker or an intellectual, but a, 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 a businessman. I remember during the interview at one point, uh, one of the persons literally said to me, uh, your resume does not scream CEO. I, I remember that. Your resume does not scream. And I said, yes, exactly. Why, is that, <laughs> why in the world would you want that? You can always hire someone to be the COO of an organization. What you need is moral leadership and political leadership, right. especially with respect to anti-Semitism around the world. But that's not what they saw when they saw, yes, they saw a Jewish intellectual uh, and that's not what they wanted. Uh, and they also wanted someone with strong connections to the Democratic Party. And Jonathan clearly had that. Again, if Hillary Clinton had been elected president, I have a feeling that Jonathan might have even left the ADL to go work in a high level position in that administration. So when you see criticism of Jonathan and the ADL, certainly of Donald Trump or some of Donald Trump's appointments, the ADL was opposed to the uh, selection, the nomination of uh, uh, Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. That was very surprising that the, that the ADL would weigh in and say that uh, a, a nominated Supreme Court justice was an extremist. That was unusual. Uh, that's something that never would have happened in prior years. Uh, and, you know, even Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, who many believe, and I certainly believe, may have been along with George Shultz in the Reagan administration, the most pro-Israel Secretary of State uh, in the in in U.S. in Israel's history uh, with the State Department. Uh, remember, Pompeo visited a, a Jewish settle, settlement in the West Bank that was un, un, unbelievable. No one, no government officials, uh, never done that, and a Secretary of State did. I, I happen to know uh, one of the leading donors of that settlement, uh, um, uh, Simon Fallick, and I was I was you know he. he he had sent me the photo of greeting Pompeo outside of this when he entered the West Bank. So again, to have been critis, criti, critical of Pompeo itself was again, a very partisan position that the ADL usually did not, you know, look, we're seeing this, we're seeing in Congress, we used to always believe in bipartisan support of Israel, and that seems to have been lost. And when you see the ADL take positions based on party affiliation, rejecting and nominations of Trump. There was, you know, a lot of criticism of, of Trump in, during, uh, the, during that, his four years in office. And remember, this was, for many progressive organizations, Donald Trump was big business. Uh, I'm sure that if you looked at the ADL's financials, you would learn that they, they probably maybe doubled their contributions during the Donald Trump era. I know that all of a sudden I read that Apple was donating to the ADL, Apple was donating to the ACLU. This was big business. So, you know, it's important to not just, you could point the finger at, at Jonathan Greenblatt uh, because he's the head of the organization, but it goes much deeper than that. It's a strategy of the board to say, we wanna be on the side of the progressives. We wanna be on the side of the Democratic party we want to be on the side of anyone who rejects Donald Trump. And that was just not Foxman's way or Perlmutter's way before them. Their view was we are just like the idea of bipartisan support for Israel. We need to be friends with both parties and we need both parties to focus on 
defamation against Jews and bigotry against other religious or ethnic or uh, religious groups. We want we, on the left and the right. And there's no question that the ADL has spent very little time uh, uh, criticizing the anti-Semitism on the left in universities. Uh, it's not that they haven't, but their bigger focus is the focus that you see in progressive circles, which is that there is a right-wing insurrectionist extremist conspiracy. And that's really where, as you know, the president of the United States has said, the most lethal threat in the United States right now is, 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 uh, is, is extremism on, on the right, insurrectionists, white supremacy. That is a, a, mar a, a calling card that we're seeing in the Democratic Party and the ADL is part of that. Uh, and, and, and I think is proudly part of it. Um, if, the Jew if Jews are concerned about where the ADL is on this, th you need to understand this is not an accident. It's a strategy that was cultivated in who they picked. They picked someone who came from the Democratic Party, had long established progressive credentials and would stand united with the very issues that we're seeing today, the 1619 Project, Black Lives Matter, critical race theory, uh, all of this, even how Alan described this new attack uh, or rather the Teshuva repentance for what was done 10 years ago. And Alan is right. I, 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 took, I, I often take a chance, but I, at that time I wrote, I was one of the few who wrote in support of the families of 9-11. Uh, I didn't see this as a First Amendment issue at all. I resented when Mayor Bloomberg lectured everyone with the Statue of Liberty behind him in a very cynical, manipulative way, as if we needed to learn from a man who was the mayor but was not a law professor. He was giving us a tutorial on the First Amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. But we knew what that meant. We understood, we understood that, that the First Amendment would prohibit the banning of mosques but that's not what was happening. If you took the hysteria seriously you, and from the outside, it would sound to you as if there was a ban on mosques in Manhattan. You couldn't build one. You didn't have any. That's what it sounded like unless you went, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's not what's happening here. There are mosques everywhere. And no one was objecting to mosques everywhere except for on the hollowed ground of 9-11 because those people that committed that dastardly crime despicable crime were motivated by the teachings of Islam. It may be an extremist view, but they were not completely a fringe group. There were, there were people who applauded this around the world uh, who were Islamists. And so there was a deep sensitivity. Remember, no bodies were, were recovered, nor could there have been. This really was the whole area of Ground Zero was sacred and also very raw at the time. The Freedom Tower hadn't even been built. Um, the museum, the memorial hadn't been built. So all of a sudden, what are we building first? What are we focusing on first? A mosque, really? And you can see how there was profound sensitivity. That's all Abe Foxman was saying. That's all I was saying. It isn't that you couldn't, it's that you shouldn't. There's a difference, right? It's a sense of mutual respect a sense of decency. People were killed here and you can reframe this as they did as this is about healing. But the people who you should ask about healing are the victim's families, not Muslims. If the victim's families believe that a mosque and a swimming pool was important for their healing, all right, I, I was not a victim that day. So I would stand in, in out of respect. What would they wish? They didn't want anything that was that would seem to them in their face to be supportive of the teachings that resulted in the death of their relatives. Whether those were extremist teachings or not, it was still associated with the teachings of Islam. And so I, that's all that this was. It, was. it was not, but instead what we saw, the focus shifted, not unlike what you're seeing today, where the focus is on the racism of the United States, and the homophobia of the United States, the progressive left's insistence that, that whiteness is irredeemable and that it's, it, everything is about racism or bigotry against vulnerable minority groups. 
the shift moved from the 9-11 attack to the attack against Muslims, right? And that really was what Jonathan Greenblatt has been said in his most recent op-ed where he was seeking teshuva. He was basically saying that this, uh, this criticism of the Ground Zero Mosque was emblematic of a general Islamophobia that started after 9-11. And I found that surprising because my understanding of their own statistics, the ADL's own statistics, which are shared with the FBI, both organizations work together. The amount, when it comes to hate crimes, which have completely, as we know, have escalated significantly over the last 20 years, the overwhelming number of people who are targeted with hate crimes are Jews. That hasn't changed. There's doubling and tripling, certainly this year alone, right? It's Jews are the primary targets of hate crimes. So the, when Jonathan said in his op-ed that there was a spike after 9-11 and there was, of course there was a spike, but I would actually say the following, which is I said many times during that time, I was one who was shocked at 9-11, after 9-11, how little blowback, brushback there was against Muslims. Let me tell you something. If there were 17 Jews involved in the attack on the, the, the hijacking of two jetliners and attacked, brought down the World Trade Center and, and crashed into the Pentagon, I don't think there would be a Jew alive in this country. I, I think the amount of attack against Jews for, for complicity that Jews were somehow involved in 9-11, I can't even imagine this. And I don't remember, I actually thought Yes, of course, there, was, there, were, there were incidents around the country. But when you think about the size of the country and the magnitude of the crime, right? When you think about the magnitude of the crime, nothing like this had ever happened. And this happened by not just Muslims, but Islamists, right? Avowed Muslims who believed that the teachings of the Quran told them that this is, a, this is what needs to happen to the infidels. I was always re found it remarkable how... how Overall, how decent Americans were, even the president of the United States, President Bush, wanted everyone to know this is not a war against Islam. It's against Islamists and, and terrorists. Uh, there was, I think, an enormous amount of mutual respect and forbearance. Yes, there was an increase in hate crimes, but nothing compared to what even in an ordinary year you saw with Jews. And you know who really knows that? Jonathan. <laughs> He really knows that because it's his people who do those, who, who, who crunch those numbers. So that's why I thought that it's interesting to return to this issue 10 years later and to now apologize to, to say that the ADL as an organization owes Muslims a, an apology because they contributed to Islamophobia, which I don't think is true and that the, any objection to the mosque could only be seen as racist. And I don't think that's true. Right. So professor, I'm glad that you brought up uh, about you know, partisanship. Uh, as much as I pride myself as being a strong conservative Republican, when it comes to fighting anti-Semitism and supporting Israel, that's where I draw the line. Uh, there are Democrats like Senator Bob Menendez, uh, Senator Joe Manchin, who I will stand with any day, and there are Democrats in the House also. Richie Torres, he's a progressive, but he's outspokenly pro-Israel, and for me, that's where I draw the line. I, I separate politics from moral issues. So I go back to Abe Foxman, because he was considered more moderate than Greenblatt, and um, you know, back in when Obama was president, he wanted Jewish organizations to sign a unity pledge to not criticize Barack Obama. Uh, I believe in 2011, Norman Podhoritz, and I'm paraphrasing, had said that Foxman seems to find an anti-Semite under the bed of every conservative. And then I think it was in 2013 where uh, Foxman um, gave a speech on Yom HaShoah called titled What If? What if more Christians had, you know, uh, had stood up against Nazism? What if more righteous Gentiles? And I'm thinking to myself, two, you know, people like Glenn Beck, people like Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, who command over 30, 40 million listeners, TV, radio, who are the most outspoken supporters of Israel. And they will call out any Republican who goes against Israel. And yet he, he compared Glenn Beck to Father Coughlin. 
Um, so, you know, to me, it scares the heck out of me to see where the ADL is going, because every time there's an anti-Semitic attack, people go, where's the ADL? As if we're A, relying on them to stand up for us, why aren't we doing it ourselves? But that the ADL has become completely unreliable. And as you pointed out, Greenblatt is part of the Democrat machine. Right, again, party affiliation seems to be important. Uh, and also a, a kind of, again, what we're seeing, a, a rejection of conservatism. Right, that if it's considered conservative, either, either a political leader or a judicial appointment, there's something wrong with it. It's again morally beyond the pale. That's really the kind of term of art we're hearing in political discourse. Right, that if it's if if it's conservative, it's 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 racist, it's homophobic, it it is you know it's about white supremacy. I'm not sure that's exactly what the ADL is saying, but it does seem that the, the basic presumption is that the Democratic Party has speaks with the moral authority of, of you know, human rights and, and anti-bigotry and that conservatives don't or can't. And I think you're right. I mean, you're right to point out that Abe Foxman was not considered ideal for a number of people politically. Uh, this issue about Christianity, I remember he was very opposed to, uh, was it Mormons or who was it that would rename uh, souls uh, for Jewish debt, the Jewish dead? Wasn't there some issue about the renaming of, of uh, souls? Or I remember, yes, I remember there it now. Was, there was something like yeah. that, you know, so Abe, you know, took a very strong position and you could argue, well, you know, the, the evangelicals are Israel's best friend. Um, but I think that, you know, Abe was interested in the broader issues about what's the end game. And yes, that, that is an issue, right? What's the end game? Well, the end game is that, you know, all Jews will eventually follow Christ. And I think that that was what Abe was concerned about, that, that, that there is a bargain for exchange, that we, we support you now, but we may not support you. Now. Look, that was Abe's position and was not an unprincipled position. I think he felt strongly that bigotry was the job of the ADL in every form, but I think what he was clearly focused on is that its primary job, its primary job was, as I said before, the defamation against the Jewish people. And that's what's really changed. And I think that even Abe, who, you know, I've spoken to over the years, I think he was surprised by the trans transformation of his own board. I think that he was surprised to discover that some of the old guard had been replaced by young guards who saw Judaism in terms of tikkun olam and the reform movement's fixation with Jews need to demonstrate their fight and, 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 and uh, protest demonstrations on behalf of others, the social activism on behalf of others and not on behalf of themselves. And in fact, to demonstrate their moral support, superiority to say, you know, I think I've said this on your show before, look at us. We're not even supporting our own people. We would even criticize our own people. Doesn't that make us morally superior? Look at us, look at us. That is, you know, we're seeing that in a lot of these progressive Jewish organizations. There's the uh, Jewish Democratic uh, Council of America. Um, uh, Haley Sofer. Uh, Haley Sofer, who, again, I know, I like her. She and I done an event together, interviewed her on a television program once. Uh, but I, I, don't, I don't agree with what she's done. And I don't agree with the positions of her organization. Um, Hyas, right? Hyas is a really good example of like a powder keg. On the one hand, it's it and the joint are primarily responsible for bringing Jew Holocaust survivors to the United States uh, after uh, the liberation of Auschwitz and the and the you know the creation of the displaced persons camp, but over time as Jews resettled, Hyas is now you know in the in 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 involved in you know the southern border. I, I can assure you, everywhere the Afghan refugees that are now coming, the Haitian refugees, Hyas at this moment, as I'm saying it, I can assure you, they're involved politically in trying to bring in as many people as possible, none of whom are Jews, right? That's not the issue. That's not the obje objective of the organization anymore. And I have to say, again, just to show you how they're labeled, the person who killed, I forgot how many Jews at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, he specifically singled out Hyas 
as if he was blaming the Jews. He was saying, here's why I'm killing Jews in a synagogue on Shabbat, because they're the ones that, right, the, even during the Charlottesville marching, when they said Jews will not replace us, they meant probably not necessarily talking about Hyas, but they were talking about their perception that Jews are so in favor of immigration that they will bring in anyone to replace Americans who are second, third generation, who they perceive to be real Americans as opposed to immigrants. And the Jews, the cosmopolitan Jews, a very long standing criticism of Jews, the cosmopolitan Jews are the ones that are responsible for immigration that res results in, in losing jobs among Americans who were born here. So again, this, there, it, this is, the ADL is not alone at all. There are a number of progressive organizations that are avowedly Jewish per se, they have Jewish in their title, but they're involved in what's clearly a partisan divisive argument uh, that has, we are seeing the polarization broadly in the United States and we're seeing certain Jewish progressive organizations lining up squarely. Here's the irony. The irony was my memory here, Bela and, and Alan, is, and again, I could be wrong, but you could look it up. I, my memory was a couple years ago, a number of progressive groups, <laughs> this is the irony of Jewish people, Jews who believe that if you just show that you care about other people, they'll care about you. Right. That's incredibly naive. It's belied by Jewish history and world history. It's never worked. Jews that fought- Not in a given. Rome, what? what? It's, it's never worked. Jews that received uh, medals fighting for Germany in World War I were in the gas chambers with everyone else. Nothing changed. You could, you could win a, a, a medal from the Kaiser Wilhelm and, and Nazism still wanted to, you to be killed, gassed and cremated. Um, two years ago, if I'm not mistaken, 60 organizations, progressive organizations, wrote a letter saying that the ADL should be kicked out of the progressive rainbow because it had a history of what we just said now, Foxman and, and the Ground Zero Mosque. Uh, by the way, it wasn't even a mosque, just to be clear. It was a recreation center that had a mosque in it. Right. So it, was, it wasn't even what they said it was. It was like, a you know, I remember, you know, some people derisively use word, you mean the Ground Zero Muslim swimming pool that also had a basketball court and had a mosque associated. You know, the, the model was like the JCC, right? That was its model or the 92nd Street Y. So um, I just think that there's an irony. It didn't get a lot of attention. Again, I could be wrong, but you, people can easily discover this, that, that, that a, a number of progressive organizations basically spit in the face of Jonathan Greenblatt and said, you can stand on your head and talk about transgender bathrooms and, and how you're challenging homophobia and racism and Islamophobia, we still treat you as white privileged colonial settlers who are benefiting from your whiteness and that you have a long standing history of taking positions that, that don't benefit people of color. Again, I don't think it received much attention. It should have. Because, but and it demonstrated this long-standing truth, which is it, it always blows up in the face of Jews when they believe that they can demonstrate their moral support superiority by criticizing their own people or the state of Israel in order to win favor of other minority groups that say, wow, look at you, you're standing with us even against your own people. It doesn't hold. And you know how, what's a really good example of that? has nothing to do with the ADL. It has to do with what happened uh, during the Gaza war when Jews were being uh, killed, uh, beaten in the streets of Los Angeles and Seattle and Miami, and of course on Times Square and the Diamond District. I don't remember one leader of the Black Lives Matter movement saying a word Correct. in support of Jews. I don't, again, I could be wrong, I'm often wrong, but if any of your viewers knows of anyone who was uh, an official with the Black Lives Matter movement or the squad, right? I don't remember them saying, we stand with Jews. Right. In this moment of time, we stand with Jews just like they stood with us. Now, let me just tell you who, who did speak like that, Martin Luther King. 
Bayard Rustin in the 1960s. That connection was very deep between Rabbi Heschel and Martin Luther King. When they linked arms, they knew what it meant. Martin Luther King was a Zionist. He would be very surprised if he heard what comes out of the Black Lives Matter movement about Israel. Right, or Professor, about we've, got, we've got about 15 okay. seconds left. Okay. okay Bale, go ahead. <laughs> we have tons of other questions, but you know. Yeah. Sorry, I, I should have talked fast. Right now. No, no, you're great, you're great. Um, I have a very, look, one quick question. Um, uh, Professor, about three years ago, November uh, 2018, um, Seth Mandel wrote a commentary accusing uh, Jonathan Greenblatt of being a man of the left. And the years leading up to his being hired, American Jews were moving to the left. So I understand you feel that that had an impact on how the ADL responds to anti-Semitism. An organization's allyship should not be conditional. And that, that's, that's, that should be a given. Yeah. Uh, we also touched uh, earlier that um, the ADL's countering hate movements on behalf of Jews was practically from the start when a teenage factory worker, Mary Fagan, was found murdered and a Jewish superintendent was framed. And that was a real life blood libel. The ADL for sure went to bat and lobbied on behalf of Leo Frank and his sentence was commuted. So here's what I'm curious about. When Jonathan Greenblatt apologized for opposing Islamic Center near Ground Zero, it gave chills to Jews everywhere, considering who designed and carried out the 9-11 attack. And the fact is that, that in the Muslim countries, they were passing out cookies in celebration. Greenblatt's response at the time was that he was concerned about the rising Islamophobia in the United States. So the question is, my question is, do you think that it's the political climate of liberalism and financial support of liberal American Jews that have brought about the change in the a ADL? Well, I, I, I've written about this a lot. It has nothing to do with liberalism. It has to do with progressivism. Uh, there's nothing liberal about these movements. They're illiberal in their denunciation of others, their cancellation of others, their demonization of others, right? Their lack of mutual respect. Uh, you know, so no, I don't, I don't think it's about liberalism. I think it's about their focus on progressive causes, which to me are illiberal. Uh, but I also want to say, you know, in defense of Jonathan, because this is where there's confusion, even within the ADL, the ADL under Jonathan Greenblatt supported the embassy move from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. You would think that this organization that was blaming ADL for the a criticism of the, a, of the mosque, Ground Zero Mosque, would, it, would be anti-Israel in that regard. As I said before, they defended Israel during its defensive war most recently in Gaza. And last, you know, when the human, United Nations Human Rights Council created a blacklist of companies that do business in the West Bank, uh, Jonathan Greenblatt and the ADL objected to that. So again, it, it isn't that simple, but I do think that what Alan started off with is, is, was, was shocking that it was a lecturing, it seemed it came across as a lecture to Jews that before you finish all of your repentance and, and al -chets, there's a massive al owed to the uh, 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 Muslim community because of the Ground Zero Mosque without regard again to the 9-11 families and to what, what actually happened on 9-11. And again, I would say a hypersensitivity to some idea that there was Islamophobia that's led to hate of Muslims, when in fact, this is an organization that you run that was avowedly about anti-defamation against Jews. And that problem has not only got, not gone away, it still leads the hate speech statistics that you chronicle. So it just seemed odd at this point to treat as if anti-Semitism has gone away. Thank God. This is the presumption. And the only issue now is racism and Islamophobia. And that's where the ADL should make its pitch. And I just think that what Alan and you, I think, were getting at in this today's program, it was an important conversation, is that it just seemed, it seemed uh, uh, strange uh, given this right. last year in which Jews were being chased down the streets in major yeah. cities. Yeah. yeah.
Yeah, who could forget uh, who could forget that? And unfortunately, it's still going on. Professor, thank you for joining us today. We are out of time and we would love to spend much more time and we invite you to come back at a future date, at a very near future date. Uh, you have certainly enlightened us tremendously. Thank you to our audience and to vinnews.com. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Definitive Wrap with your hosts, Bela Sebro and Alan Skorsky. Be sure to tell your family and friends they also can listen to The Definitive Wrap on Apple Music, Spotify, Google Play, and your favorite streaming service. See you next time on The Definitive Wrap. <laughs>